Okay, we'll continue with the read-through of the new Dungeons & Dragons starter kit, the Dragons of Stormwreck Isle, and we're up to Chapter 4, Clifftop Observatory, and this is the last chapter. This chapter assumes the characters visit the observatory after exploring Seagrow Caves and the Wreck of Compass Rose, and thus have reached 3rd level. If they come here before visiting the other adventure sites, the combat encounters are probably too difficult for them. That's the reason Runara won't give the characters the Moonstone Key or information about the observatory until after they've dealt with the island's other problems. If necessary, you can have Runara warn the characters that they're not ready to face this part of the adventure yet. Observatory Overview During its heyday, the Clifftop Observatory was a marvel of magical innovation. Adorned with gorgeous stained glass windows and marble spires, the observatory's towers stood high above the churning sea on separate islets, linked by shimmering bridges of magical energy. But the observatory was wrecked when Renara battled her blue dragon rival centuries ago, and now it lies in ruin, a crumbled memory overtaken by nature. In recent months, the observatory ruins have become the home of an arrogant blue dragon wormling called Sparkrender, a descendant of Runara's ancient rival. Like his ancestor, Sparkrender seeks to claim the destructive magic that lingers at the site. Like Runara, Sparkrender has recruited kobolds to join his cause. About five days before the characters arrived on the island, a bronze dragon wormling named Adron left the safety of Dragon's Rest and Runara's tutelage and came to the ancient observatory. The two wormlings met and immediately clashed. Sparkrender attempted to turn the bronze wormling against Runara, but Adron's hatred of chromatic dragons was stronger than his disagreement with Runara. Ultimately, Sparkrender overpowered Adron and imprisoned him, and imprisoned him in the observatory ruins. Sparkrender believes Adron is the key to unlocking the observatory's magic and claiming his ancestor's power. With the bronze wormling imprisoned, Sparkrender began planning a ritual that will awaken the spirits of the island's dead dragons and bind them to his will at the cost of Adrian's life. Observatory Features The observatory is built on a series of basalt spires jutting up from the ocean at the southeastern tip of Stormwreck Isle. Almost all the structure's former ceilings and walls have crumbled away, exposing the ruins to the open air. Unless otherwise noted, the ruins stand 30 feet above the ocean's surface. The rugged cliffs offer abundant hand and footholds, so a character who jumps or falls into the water and survives, see the falling section of the rulebook, can climb back up without needing to make an ability check. Running this chapter. Once the characters to decide to visit the Clifftop Observatory, they have three options for reaching the site by boat, along the coast, or over land. By boat, Dragon's Rest has a rowboat the characters can take around the eastern end of the island. The trip to the observatory is five miles, which takes about three hours and 20 minutes to row. Along the coast, walking around the coast of the island is a little easier than rowing and a quicker trip despite the characters having to walk around the eastern bay instead of rowing across it. The six-mile trip takes only two hours at a normal walking pace. Overland. The characters can walk southeast from Dragon's Rest to the head of the bay, where a rough path cuts across the island to the eastern bay. The rocky ground of the island is difficult terrain, but this is still the fastest and most direct route. Characters can make the three-and-a-half-mile trip in about one hour and 15 minutes. Approaching by land. If the characters approach the observatory by land, read the following. So this gets read out loud to the players. Clambering over the rocky ground of Stormwreck Isle, you spot strange, twisted protrusions of glassy crystal jutting from the earth. The vegetation in this area bears reddish, branching scars that form similar shapes. Suddenly you hear a screeching roar and notice a winged, glittering blue shape swooping overhead. 
Now moving into the DM only information, though this often gets shared with players once they ask questions and such. The blue shape is Spark Render flying by. This glimpse of the dragon is an opportunity to make your players nervous about the foe they're about to face. Feel free to elaborate on the description of Spark Render and play on the character's worries that he might spot them, but ultimately he passes by but ultimately he passes by without noticing. The characters see him come to rest on a rocky spire off the coast as he returns to his horde among the ruins in area D5. And we'll take a look at the map here in a moment. A character who examines the crystalline protrusions or the scarred vegetation can make a DC 10 intelligence nature check. On a success, the characters recognizes the phenomenon as a sign of lightning strikes or the lightning breath of a blue, a blue or bronze dragon. Assuming the characters continue toward the observatory, they soon arrive at area D1, described below. Okay, so that's if they approach by land. Now, if they approach by water, then you would read this text instead of this text. As you round the southeastern tip of the island, you can see crumbling ruins atop basalt columns just off the main island body. If you pull the boat ashore on the island, it would be an easy walk up to the top of the cliffs, though there is no obvious bridge from the cliffs to the ruins. Alternatively, you could tie the boat up at the bottom of the columns and try to climb directly up the ruins. As you consider these options, you hear a screeching roar and notice a winged, glittering blue shape swooping through the air ahead of you. The figure comes to rest atop the column farthest from Stormwreck Isle and vanishes from sight. And again, here's your DM information. Again, Sparkrander does not notice the characters as he returns to his lair, but feel free to tease the players with the idea that he might notice them. If the characters beach the boat on the shore, they can easily climb the bluffs to area D1 described below. If they tie up the boat at the base of one of the pillars, they can instead climb to the area atop it, area D2, D3, D4, or D5. So let's take a quick look at the map here while we're uh, talking about these locations. So here, this is area D1. Let's just take a look here, Flash, flip back over to here for a moment. So if the characters beach the boat on the shore, they can easily climb the bluffs to area D1. And then if they tie up the boat to the base of one of the pillars, okay. So if they beach the boat over this way, they can easily get here. If they uh, bring the boat around to any of these locations, they can easily climb up and get directly into D4, directly into D5, and so on. Sparkrender's Cobalt Allies. The Cobalts who joined forces with Sparkrender are lawful, are lawful evil and cruel. Their initial reaction toward outsiders is hostile. See the social interactions in the rulebook. But they're more likely to warn intruders to leave the ruins than to immediately attack. They readily threaten violence and back up their threats with combat if necessary. As an action, a character can try to con a character can try to convince a hostile kobold to have a conversation or to allow the characters to explore the area. Doing so on a successful DC 15 charisma check. Depending on the character's approach, the deception, intimidation, or persuasion skill can apply to the check. This list summarizes what the kobolds know. Kobold history. The kobolds here have served Sparkrender for about a year. They revere the Blue Dragon as a semi-divine figure and trust him to provide for their every need. Big plans. Sparkrender has big plans that will allow him to manifest his full power. The Wormling is waiting for the sculpture in the Rotunda Ruins Area D2 to tell him it's time to act. The Kobolds think it must be soon, possibly even today. Dragon Visitor. Not long ago, another dragon arrived. 
This other dragon was about Spark Render's size, but looked like greenish yellow metal. They remember hearing the two arguing at the observatory, area D5, and they have heard the other dragons roaring and crashing around inside the tower, area D6, since then. So, D6, that's up here. Caved in wall. Though the kobolds have been trying to tidy the ruins, Spark Render specifically told them not to clean up the newly caved in wall at the base of the observatory tower, area D6. The caved in wall is visible from area D3. So, this area here to this area here. Observatory locations. The following locations are keyed to map 5, which shows the layout of the cliff top observatory. So when they arrive at location D1, this is the text that we'll read. A broken and overgrown path winds to the edge of the cliff. The overlook is marked by two marble statues veined with gold, each carved in the shape of a dragon with its mouth open in a silent roar. And then here's your DM information. At the base of each statue is a small hexagonal indentation, about one inch wide and two inches deep, perfectly sized to accommodate the moonstone key Renara gave them. When the key is inserted into the base of either statue, magical light sparks to life in both statues' open, open mouths, and a shining bridge made of iridescent magical energy extends from the overlook to the observatory ruins, Area D2. The bridge is sturdy, and lasts until the key is removed from the statue. D2. So when they arrive at D2, this is our block text that we read. <clears throat> broken stones, broken stone lines this plaza. Fragments of elegant statues, once, magnific once magnificent pillars, and shining marble walls. At the center, a tall sculpture of rusted planets and gilded stars spins idly in a jerky mimicry of celestial motion. A gargled screech suddenly rises from across the plaza. A half dozen bat-like creatures are swarming around two two-winged kobolds with blue paint smeared across their long snouts. The kobolds are fighting fiercely, but they seem close to being overwhelmed. And this is our DM information. The two winged kobolds are locked in battle with eight sturges. And I think we've already looked at all these character, uh, all these monsters by this point. When the character enters, when the characters enter the area, six of the sturges turn their attention to this new, juicier prey. The kobolds try to deal with the remaining two sturges and then decide what to do based on what the characters are doing. If the characters actively help the kobolds during the battle, then the kobolds return the favor. If the characters attack the kobolds instead, or as well as the sturges, the kobolds fight back. Otherwise, the kobolds hang back, trying to stay out of the way until the fight is over. Once the sturges have been defeated, if the kobolds survive, they approach the characters. Their names are Mech and Min, and they're the brothers of Myla, the kobold tinkerer at Dragon's Rest. They left their sister for dead after the Sturge attack that maimed her wings. They have sworn loyalty to Sparkrender, and they share the dragon's cruel, haughty demeanor. If the characters actively helped the kobolds, or mention that Myla is alive, the kobold's attitude becomes friendly. They offer to introduce the character, the characters to their leader, and help the characters in any way they can, such as retrieving the Moonstone key from Area D1 so the characters can activate the bridge to D4. They won't help the characters fight Spark Render, though. They are loyal to the dragon. Golden Sculptor The sculptor in the center of the rotunda is an astronomical model used for research in centuries past. The sculpture depicts the planet of, Tor the planet of Toril, the world of the Forgotten Realms, its moon called Selun, the sun, and seven other planets, as well as one comet with a very eccentric orbit. 
A character who studies the sculpture can puzzle out its importance with a successful DC-15 intelligence arcana check. Its current position suggests the comet will soon pass very close to Toril. Sparkrender plans to hold his ritual when the comet is at its closest point. He believes the comet, called the King Killer, called the King Killer Star, controls the destiny of dragons and will allow him to claim the power of the dragons who fell on Stormwreck Isle. Dragon Effigies The Sturge attack interrupted the kobolds from their assigned task of preparing this site for Spark Render's ritual. With the Wormling's help, they have crudely sculpted five chunks of rubble into vaguely draconic, draconic shapes and splashed each one with paint, and the kobolds were in the process of arranging them and around, arranging them around the metal sculpture. Each effigy has the name of the dragon it represents etched into it. These are the names and colors of the five dragons. Estelagan is bronze. Kleisavar is gold. Elden Emmer is blue. Sharuth is red. Turadur is brass. If the characters ask the kobolds about these dragon effigies, mech and men swell with pride and explain that they crafted them according to Sparkrender's instructions. The kobolds know the effigies have some part to play in Sparkrender's plans. Energy Bridge Anchors A pair of dragon statues, like the ones in Area D1, stands on the west side of the rotunda, and another pair stands on the southwest side. If the Moonstone Key is inserted in one of these statues, the western pair creates a bridge to the Overlook, Area D1, and the southwestern pair creates a bridge to a crumbled and isolated tower, Area D4. D3 Cobalt Map, uh, Cobalt Camp. A rickety bridge made of driftwood and rope spans the 15-foot gap between the rotunda, Area D2, and the structure. So here's Area D2, here's Area D3. And when they arrive at D3, the uh, block text that we read is as follows. Skittering sounds and whispers come from inside this ruined tower. Gaps in the stone are patched over with wooden planks and threadbare cloth. And then this is our DM information. Three kobolds, Akrash, Erp, and Hev, and two winged kobolds, Nuru and Sneerk, currently inhabit this camp, polishing sling bullets and keeping busy until it's time for Spark Render's ritual. Initially, the kobolds are hostile toward the characters, determined to scare off the intruders. They are susceptible to intimidation, though. As an action, a character can make a DC-13 Charisma Intimidation check, convincing them to back down on success. Area D4. Isolated Study. No bridge spans the 22-foot gap between the rotunda and the spire, unless the characters use the Moonstone Key to activate the Energy Bridge in Area D2. Characters might come up with a number of ingenious ways to cross the gap. See the sidebar called Clever Solutions for advice to help you determine what these solutions, what, wh whether these solutions work. And then when you arrive at Area D4, this is the block text that gets read. The rhythm of the waves below echoes throughout this cramped tower. Part of the floor has crumbled away, dropping off into, the, dropping off into a chamber below. Amid the rubble, collapsed bookcases jut out at odd angles, and moldering books are strewn across the floor. And here's your DM information. Scholar's Journal. Throughout most of the uh, though most of the books have fallen apart, one tome, a small black journal with an ornate lock, remains intact. A character who examines the book and succeeds on a DC-15 wisdom perception check notices a small arcane rune engraved above the keyhole on the journal's lock. A character who casts the detect magic spell also sees a faint aura around the keyhole. 
This rune is a magical trap that triggers if the journal is opened without the use of its original key, which is long lost. A character who makes a successful DC-11 Intelligence Arcana check can determine how to disarm the trap by carefully scratching over the rune with a dagger, a sharp piece of wire, or similar implement. Once this is done, the journal can safely be opened either by picking the lock with thieves' tools and making a, su a successful DC-10 dexterity check, or by breaking the lock with a successful DC-12 strength check. If the lock is opened without first disarming the trap, the magic trap spews out noxious green gas, and the character who opened the lock takes three poison damage or roll 1d6 to determine the damage. Let's read over these clever solutions. Clever solutions. The challenges characters face in this adventure can have more than one solution. For example, to reach the isolated study area D4, characters could try any of these approaches. Ask the winged kobold to retrieve the moonstone key from area D1 so it could be used again in area D2. Dive or climb down into the water below, swim over to the other column, and climb back up to the study. Have a character use the Misty Step spell to cross the gap and explore alone. Remember, there's more than one way to proceed, though, to proceed through an adventure, and more than one way to play D&D. When characters come up with clever solutions to tricky problems, reward them with success, or at least give them a good chance of success. Use the guidelines in the imp Improvising Ability Checks section at the start of this booklet to help you. Embrace your player's creativity and let them surprise you. Inside the journal contains star maps and notes on experiments with magic. One passage is underlined near the start of the journal. It, it reads in an archaic dialect of common, To ye four scholars, point your eyes toward the dragon's light, for it guides your descent, your descent into knowledge. This passage is a clue to unlocking the hidden entrance in the observatory tower, area D5. Treasure. A character who searches the tower and succeeds on a DC-12 intelligence investigation check finds a loose brick in the northwest wall. Pulling the brick out reveals a hidden compartment containing a potion of resistance, lightning described in Appendix A, and a pouch holding 10 gold pieces. Area D5, Observatory Tower. Standing taller than the rest of the observatory, the main floor of this tower is 45 feet above the ocean's surface, which puts it 15 feet above the floor of the rotunda Area D2. The kobolds have constructed a rough pulley lift so the wingless kobolds can reach this area when Spark Render summons them. When you arrive in this area, this is the block text that gets read. Rays of light dance across the remains of this tower's stained glass dome, making iridescent columns shimmer through shimmer across the crumbled marble walls. Gilded lines and jeweled inlays form a detailed star map spanning the dusty floor. Four alabaster statues of scholars stand around the per perimeter of the room, their expressions worn with time. Each ten-foot-tall statue is pointing or gesturing in a different direction. Curled in the northeast corner of the tower is a lithe blue dragon. Lightning arcs around his horns and snout as he slumbers amid a scattered collection of coins and glittering jewels. And then this is the DM information. Spark Render, the blue dragon wormling, is currently sleeping here, curled up against the northeast wall. So let's take a look at the blue dragon, the big, big bad evil guy for this adventure. Let's see here. Okay, so this is the artwork, obviously, and creature descriptions. 
So dragons are winged reptiles of ancient lineage and fearsome power. The oldest dragons, over a thousand years old, are some of the most powerful creatures in the world. Dragons innate magic fuels, their dreaded breath weapons, and other preternatural abilities. The chromatic and metallic dragon families encompass most of dragon kind. The chromatic dragons, black, blue, green, red, and white, are largely selfish, evil, and feared. The metallic dragons, brass, bronze, copper, gold, and silver, are typically noble, good, and respected by the wise. Though their goals and ideals vary tremendously, most dragons covet wealth, hoarding mounds of coins, and gathering gems, jewels, and magic items. Chromatic and metallic dragons pass through four distinct stages of life, from wormling to ancient dragons. Each, uh, even wormlings, in their first five years of life are fearsome threats, and wise adventurers do not underestimate them or dismiss them as children. Blue dragons. Vain and territorial, many blue dragons take pleasure in lording their power over creatures they see as lesser. Okay, so the uh, spark render is a blue dragon wormling, so we'll read this here. He has an armor class of 17, natural armor. Uh, 52 hit points, or you roll 8d8 and add 16 to that number to determine how many hit points the uh, spark render will have. Speed is 30, burrow 15, and can fly at a speed of 16, uh, 60. Saving throws, dex plus 2, con plus 4, whiz plus 2, charisma plus 4. Skills, perception plus 4, stealth plus 2. Damage, immunities, lightning. Senses, blindsight out to 10 feet, dark vision up to 60 feet. Has a passive perception of 14 and speaks draconic. The challenge rating of this dragon is 3. The actions of the dragon are bite. It's a melee weapon attack, plus 5 to hit with a reach of 5 feet, hitting one target. Upon a hit, it deals 8 damage, or 1d10 plus 3 if you're rolling for it, and that's piercing damage, plus 3 additional lightning damage, or 1d6 if you roll it, worth of lightning damage. And it has lightning breath with a recharge of 5 to 6. The dragon exhales lightning in a 30-foot line that is 5 feet wide. Each creature in that line must make a DC 12 dexterity saving throw, taking 22 lightning damage, or you roll 4d10 on a failed save, or half as much damage on a successful, um, on a successful save. Okay, this presents the characters with an important choice. They can waken the dragon and fight him now, or they can sneak past the dragon, find a way into the secret library below area D6, and free Adron, and then fight Spark Render with Adron's help. Either approach is fine. The fight will be easier for the characters with Adron on their side, but they can still triumph without Adron's help. You don't need to encourage one course of action or the other. Make sure the players realize they have a choice, though. You can mech you can use mech and men, the kobolds from D2, to remind the characters there's another dragon around. As you describe the observatory tower, you can also highlight the caved in wall beneath in area D6 as a potential point of access to the tower. Or you can just tell the players they have these two options, plus any others they come up with on their own. Sneaking around. If the characters move quietly around the area, they can avoid waking Spark Render as long as at least half of them succeed on a DC 14 dexterity stealth check. If the characters try to turn the statues, see hidden entrance below, without waking Spark Render, have the characters turning the north and east statues nearest the sleeping dragon each make a DC 14 stealth check. On a failed check, the noise of a turning statue wakens the dragon. Wakening, waking the dragon. If awakened, Spark Render is hostile toward the characters, growling and barking threats in Draconic. Characters who speak Draconic, the Paladin and the Wizard, can try to convince the dragon not to attack by making a DC-12 Charisma check and applying the Deception intimidation or persuasion skills as appropriate. 
A character who succeeds on the checks stops Spark Render from attacking immediately, and he instead takes the opportunity to boast about his grand ambitions. If no character succeeds, if no character successfully intervenes, or if a character mentions Adron or Runara, Spark Render snarls and attacks. Despite his youth, Spark Render is a fearsome foe and a loathsome villain. He uses Breath Weapon on his first turn and every round it is available thereafter. Clever characters can try to use the statues for cover from the dragon's breath. See cover in the rulebook. Consider having the Wormling deliver short lines of dialogue on each of his turns, inspired by the following examples. You pests! will not stand in my way. I will claim the might of my ancestors. Get out of here before I tire of this game and end you all. Chromatic dragons are rightful rulers of the world. Bow down to the children of Tiamat. Enough of this. This work is too important to be hindered by the likes of you. The dragon fights until reduced to 10 or fewer hit points, at which he swears vengeance against the characters and attempts to flee the island and attempts to flee the island st uh, st starting on his next turn. He might say something like this as he takes the disengage action and flies away. I swear by the elder, let's see, Elden I swear by Elden Mer, the raging storm and the five heads of Tiamat, you will pay for this insult. If the characters flee, Spark Render does not pursue them, but he taunts them as they run away. He might say something like, Yes, flee before my might, as all will flee when I claim my inheritance. If the characters defeat Spark Render, if the characters defeat Spark, Spark Render, they hear him growling and yelping coming from below them, area D6. Hidden Entrance Each of the four statues can be rotated on its base. To unlock the hidden entrance to the observatory's secret archive, each statue must be rotated so it points at the constellation called the Dragon of Dawn on the floor's star map. If the characters found the clue in the isolated study of area D4, exhorting four scholars to point your eyes toward the dragon's light, they might search the star map for a constellation that looks like a dragon. A character who searches the floor and succeeds on a DC-10 intelligence investigation check finds a constellation resembling a dragon in the southeast quadrant of the floor. In lieu of that information, a character who searches the room for clues and succeeds on a DC-15 wisdom perception check notices worn grooves in the base of each statue, suggesting that the statue can turn on their bases. While turning a statue, a character can make a DC-10 wisdom perception check. If the check succeeds, the character notices the statue settles slightly when it is pointing toward the southeast quadrant of the room and requires extra effort to nudge it out of that position. Once each statue is in its correct position, a semicircle section at the center of the floor begins to glow before descending into the library, area D6. It forms a spiral staircase leading down to the floor of the library. When any statue is rotated out of its position, the staircase rises back up, sealing the library shut once more. A character on the staircase, when this happens, is lifted up to this area on the rising stairs. Treasure with Spark Render no longer defending his fledgling horde, characters can gather it up. It includes large piles of coins, 4,500 copper, 2,200 silver, and 130 gold. There are also 10 gems, 5 pale blue quartz crystals worth 10 gold each, and 5 jasper stones worth 50 gold each. A waterproof leather case holds a blue silk fan painted with powdered blue gems worth 25 gold. There are also a few ordinary items Spark Render enjoyed, including a crude flute with a pleasing sound, an hourglass filled with sparkling sand, 
and a set of seven candlesticks. Area D6, the secret library. This space was formerly a hidden archive of knowledge accessible only to those who knew the observatory's secrets. However, the walls of the tower are crumbling, a fact that Sparkrender used to trap Adrian here. After weakening the bronze wormling, Sparkrender forced him into the library and then caused one of the walls to cave in, sealing the exit. If the characters don't use the hidden entrance in area D5, if the characters don't use the hidden entrance in area D5, they can attempt to clear away the rubble from the cave-in to access the secret library. To access the rubble, the characters must climb down from area D5 or swim to the bottom of this of this spire and climb up from the water. Clearing the rubble takes one character 30 minutes, or the characters can work together to clear it faster. For example, it takes two characters 15 minutes, or five characters 6 minutes. If the characters are trying to clear the rubble quietly, it takes twice as long, and at least half of the characters must succeed on a DC 14 dexterity stealth check to avoid wakening spark render. Once they've cleared the rubble, the characters can access the library's interior. So when they arrive in this area, this is the block text. Stale air, heavy with the smell of old parchment, floods your nostrils. The walls are lined with shelves stuffed full of old tomes and yellowing scrolls. Glass cases, toppled over and shattered, have strewn their contents across the stone floor. The sound of splintering wood echoes through the space. And a moment later, you see an agitated bronze dragon the size of a bear picking himself up from the wreckage of the old desk he apparently crashed into. Now, here's your DM information. Adron, the, brand, the bronze dragon wormling, excitedly greets the characters when they enter. Sounds like a puppy dog. <laughs> He, he has spent his days he has spent days trying to dig his way out through the caved in wall, but his efforts from the inside only cause further collapse. He is eager to escape, but if the characters ask, he explains his conflict with Sparkrender. He expresses regret over his inability to defeat the blue wormling and concern for the safety of the island's other inhabitants. And he is terrified of the fate of Sparkrender has in store for him. The Blue Dragon plans to use Adrian's death to claim the power of all the undead or all the dead dragons on the island, transforming himself into a mighty draconic, draconic avatar, avatar. If the characters have not yet defeated Sparkrender, Adrian, uh, Adrian decides to face the Blue Dragon himself. He flies to the top of the observatory tower, area D5 to confront Sparkrender once more. However, Adrian is too weak to defeat Sparkrender alone. He needs the character's help. Once Sparkrender is defeated, the Bronze Worm is excited to return to Dragon's Rest with the characters. Treasure. This library was once a repository of magical knowledge and items of power, though most of its contents are too weathered to read. However, a character who searches through the room and succeeds on a DC 10, 15 intelligence investigation check finds a plus one battle axe, battle axe or a spell scroll of hold person, which is a plus one weapons and spell scrolls are both described in Appendix A. A detect magic spell reveals the location of both these items without requiring an ability check. Adrian has also cataloged the contents of the room and can, and can direct the characters to these valuable items. Sparkrender's Ritual If the characters leave the observatory without defeating Sparkrender, they might return to find the Blue Wormling's ritual underway. This is most likely to happen if the characters leave and take a long rest before confronting Sparkrender, or if they flee from combat with spark render and return after they've rested. Another possibility is that the characters drive spark render away from the island without killing him, but leave Adron imprisoned in area D6. 
In this case, Renara urges the characters to return to the observatory to find Adron. When they arrive, Sparkrender has also rested, healed, and returned to finish his work. In either case, the characters arrive just as Sparkrender's ritual is getting underway. If they took or destroyed the dragon effigies in Area D2, they have been replaced by even cruder versions created in a hurry. So if this, is, if this happens, then this is the block text that you read. Streams of colored lights... Uh, streams of colored light swirl through the air around the golden statue in the ruin rotunda. Each shimmering display seems to originate from one of the five dragon effigies you saw before, and the light's colors match the colors of the effigies, red, gold, brass, blue, and bronze. A blue dragon is perched atop the sculpture, throwing his head back in pain or ecstasy as the lights surrounded him, and he unleashed a bolt of lightning up toward the sky. At the base of the statue, a bronze dragon is bound to the bound, is bound to the ground by three heavy chains. He looks like he's in agony. And your DM information. To stop the ritual, the characters must face Sparkrender, the blue dragon wormling, potentially with the help of Adron, the bronze dragon wormling. If they can free Adron from his chains, see freeing Adron. Any surviving kobolds and winged kobolds lurk here, but they stay out of combat if possible. See, see waking the dragon in area D5 for ideas on how to play Sparkrender in his encounter. He uses, he uses breath weapon as the characters approach the scene, unleashing lightning into the sky. So he has to wait for this action to recharge before he can use it on the characters this time. He fights to the death. He has too much writing on the success of this ritual to abandon it now. Dragon Spirits At the end of each round of combat, on, on initiative count zero after everyone else has acted, a random magical effect occurs caused by the magical light's that swirl around the rotunda. These lights are manifestations of the blue of, of the dragon's spirits. Sparkrender is trying to bind to himself, but their effects are unpredictable. Roll a d10 and consult the dragon's spirits table to see what happens. So on a roll of one or two, you get Astalagan's blessing. Adron and the characters each regain 1d4 plus 4 hit points as the bronze light surrounds them with warmth. So that's a positive effect. On a roll of 3 or 4, you get Clisavar's Clis Flames. Sparkrender must succeed on a DC 12 dexterity saving throw or take 7 fire damage as the golden light crashes into them, or you would roll 2d6. So that's okay. So apparently these are helping you. On a roll of five or six, you get Elden Namir's gift. Sparkrender's breath weapon recharges as the blue light enfolds him. Actually, that one doesn't help you. <laughs> On a roll of seven or eight, Sharuth's Fury. Each of the characters must succeed on a DC 12 dexterity saving throw or take three fire damage as the red light erupts with fire, or you would roll 1d6. Again, that doesn't help you. 9 or 10. Terrader's Tricks. Adron and the characters gain advantage on attack rolls and saving throws until initiative count 0 of the next round, as the brass light shimmers and sparks around them. Okay, so 3 help, 2 don't help. So that's not bad. What is that, a 60% chance of something helping you? Freeing Adron. Adron is bound by three heavy chains that keep him restrained. He can still take actions such as biting or clawing an enemy that comes within his reach, but he knows Sparkrender is unaffected by his lightning breath weapon, so he doesn't bother using it. He might use his repulsion breath if he can see a good use for it. Large clasps attach the chains to iron rings embedded in the ground. A character can use an action to undo one clasp. Once all three clasps are undone, 
Adron is no longer restrained, though the chains reduce his speed by 10 feet. Removing the chains from Adron takes 10 minutes. Disrupting the Ritual The most straightforward way to prevent Sparkrender from completing his ritual and obtaining the power he craves is to kill him. But characters can also use their actions in combat to interfere with the process and hinder Sparkrender in magical ways. Let the players try whatever they can imagine using these ideas as examples. So idea number one, manipulate the effigies. A character might use an action to lift an effigy closer to the central sculpture, breathe, breathe a prayer to the dragon it represents, or otherwise coax magic from it. Doing so immediately triggers the corresponding effect from the dragon spirit's table. Idea number two, destroy the effigies. A character might break an effigy or throw it over the crumbling wall into the ocean below. This ensures the corresponding effect does not occur again. Reroll if you get that result on the dragon spirit's table. So you would want to get rid of these two. <laughs> Idea number three, manipulate the sculpture. Characters might try to manipulate the golden sculpture as a way of disrupting the ritual. The sculpture is large and sturdy. The, the sculpture is large and sturdy though, so a single action has no noticeable effect on the sculpture or the magic. The sculpture has an AC of 20, it has 27 hit points, and immunity to poison and psychic damage. However, disturbing the sculpture does distract Spark Render. The first time a character uses an action to attack or otherwise try to disturb the sculpture, the distracted blue dragon has disadvantage on attack rolls and, save, and saving throws until the end of his next turn. Once he sees the character's meddling isn't very effective, he can't be distracted in this way again. Ending the Adventure With Adrun in tow, the characters can return victorious to Dragon's Rest. Runara is pleased by the bronze, wormling, by the bronze wormling's safe return. As a reward, she gives each of the characters a potion of healing and an exquisite pearl worth 100 gold pieces. She welcomes them to stay at Dragon's Rest as long as they wish and furnishes them with whatever supplies they need for their travels when they're ready to leave the island. If Sparkrender is dead, she grieves the death of yet another dragon on Stormwreck Isle, but does not condemn the characters for killing him. If your players wish to continue playing their characters, you can use the contents of this set to create your own adventure. The Exploring the Island section of Chapter 1 offers additional encounters you can use if characters haven't already faced them. Perhaps Sparkrender or a relative of his pursues the characters in search of revenge, or perhaps something uncovered in the secret library leads the characters to a distant locale in pursuit of more adventure. If you want to advance these characters beyond third level and create adventures for them, you'll need the basic rules online or the advanced rulebook, the player's handbook, the dungeon master's guide, and the monster's manual. And I believe that's it. Let's flip the page here. Yep, that's the end of chapter four. So after that, we just get into the appendices for magic items, creatures, and uh, and that's it. So yeah, not a real super long adventure. I have a feeling this could be wrapped up in, um, I mean, it, uh, it always depends on how long your players spend role playing and <clears throat> doing other things, but uh, I don't know, probably four, five, five sessions would be my guess. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this read-through of Dragons of Stormwreck Isle.